Good morning, Foothill Church. My name is Elise Tozier. I'm a covenant partner, and I volunteer by leading one of our growth groups. And today's scripture is found in Colossians 3, um, verse 8 through 17. But now you must put, put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is God's word. You may be seated. All right, Colossians chapter 3. How many of you have ever found yourself at an occasion where you are not dressed appropriately, right? It's a casual event and you came formally, or it's a formal event and you came casually, or it's uh, not a costume party, but you came in a costume, right? You, you feel this, I, my, my, my staff punked me several years ago and told me we were having a Christmas party where everybody was going to be dressed as Santa Claus. So I dressed as Santa Claus and got there and nobody was, I was the only one, right? It's a very awkward feeling. Um, but I bet none of us uh, dressed in such a way that it caused a, a revolution, Uh, Apparently, uh, if we go back in history, October 5th, 1789 is when a large group of women stormed uh, the, 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 the palace of Versailles in Paris, France. Uh, they, were, they were there to protest not only the fact that they needed bread, and, uh, and, and the, but they were there to protest the poor living conditions. In fact, a juxtaposition between their living conditions and the royalty of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette and their royal consort, right? And, and uh, so they came and they were angry and they wanted to plead with the king to rectify things. And so they expected to receive an audience from the king and they didn't, they, they, they got it. He actually came out onto the balcony with Marie Antoinette and, um, but, but what they received was different than they expected. It would have been right for him to show up and for her to show up on the balcony wearing all their royal and formal garb, right? To show deference and respect to the people that were there. But rather, they apparently showed up in hunting gear, right? Hunting outfit. I don't know what that looked like in, in the 18th century, but, but uh, there they were. And, and the people took that as a sign of disrespect. They took it as a sign that you don't care about us. You don't want to hear our complaints. You're more worried about getting out of here and continuing to do your rich stuff and go hunting. Their, their, their attire caused major division, and that division, I think we know how the French Revolution ended, very different than the American Revolution. Now, the reason, here's why I bring this up. Your dress matters. Now, I don't mean your, obviously, how you're dressed today. But Paul's going to basically say, starting in chapter 3, that if you're a Christian, right? Look how he says it. In fact, open your Bibles with me and go to to Colossians chapter 3. And look what he says. He's starting this off to essentially say, if you're a Christian, if then you've been raised with Christ, now do this, right? If this is true of you, if Christ is your life, if all this is true, then there are things you should do, there's things you shouldn't do. There are things you should wear, there are things you shouldn't wear. There are things he's going to say, put on this, put off that, right? The idea is a spiritual attire, your dress matters. We're to put on, we're to put off. Why? Why are we to dress a certain way, spiritually speaking? Well, uh, Paul's going to say in other places that, that we, we are to live lives worthy of the gospel that we say we believe. We're to adorn the gospel, he tells us, in every respect. 
Okay, that's, that's certainly one of the reasons why. But in the context of what he's doing here, right, what he's doing is saying, look, what I want to do is prevent division and disunity among you. In fact, these, these false teachers have probably started to infiltrate Colossae, and they're, 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 they're teaching things, and that's starting to stir some things up. And he's saying, no, we got to stop that. How do we keep this kind of division from happening? And so, in fact, it's the clothes that could cause or heal the division. It could, it could cause a tearing down or a building up. And, of course, Paul wants them to be built up. Now, this is really important that we talk about this. Um, disunity and division in the church has become more and more common over the last three years, hasn't it? Um, in fact, in the last, since 2020... One, one survey says that over 4,000 churches have closed, lots of them siding, just torn apart, like exploded, done, out. Uh, 20,000 pastors have resigned from their pulpits with, with uh, huge numbers of them citing uh, a division and discord. I, I feel like I can't please anybody, right? Everybody's mad at me kind of thing. Um, so there, there, was a, there was a survey done recently that said as many as 50% of pastors would find, would, would do anything else other than be in the ministry if they could find it. Now, this is not a passive-aggressive way of me saying, I, I, you're, you're, you're hurting me. I love my job. I love Fiddle Church. In fact, I brag about you a lot. Like when we talk about the last three years, I'm usually like, I'm so grateful to God that he has allowed us to walk in unity overall together. And that has been a wonderful, wonderful blessing. But the, but the, the fact still remains, this is a real issue in the church. We have to fight, if you will, for unity. We have to do the things that will hold us together. And what, how do we do that? This is what Paul's doing in, chapters, in chapter 3. He's basically saying, hey, here's what will tear you apart. Here's what will kill unity among you. Here's what will build it up. Okay, so the reason I wanted to back up, Chris did an amazing job last week of walking us through verses 1 through 11. All I want to do is back up, just sort of put it in the context of unity, right? In other words, these things that Paul starts listing, listing in verse 8, these are unity killers, aren't they? Right? I mean, he says, if, if, if you've got these things going, uh, uh, among you, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, right, that's going to kill unity among you. We're angry with one another, where there's malice, there's slander, and then he says obscene talk, right? In other words, I think what he means there by obscene talk is well, what it sounds like, but probably in the context of you being so angry with somebody that the words start to fly, right? You start using foul language, I mean, this is an aside. We did a podcast a couple of weeks ago, um, and one of the questions, there was kind of this ask anything, and one of the questions was, um, is, is, you know, using foul, harsh language okay for the Christian? I, I, I cannot find anywhere in Scripture that says obscene language, obscene talk is acceptable to God for a Christian. I'm not saying for the world. We shouldn't be like surprised, oh my gosh, I can't listen to that. No, that happens, right? But for us, that just shouldn't be happening. It certainly shouldn't be happening in the one another's, right? So he says that, that, that these are things, and why do we not do these things? Why, there, why is there no malice and anger and wrath and slander and obscene talk? Well, because they're bad, yes, but because we're, we've been raised with Christ, and one day we will be with Him in glory, Paul says in verses 1 through 4, right? Because we have now put on, put off this new, put off the old man, put on the new man, and now we're living in light of that, right? That, that's, that's what he's after, that these, these old ways are gone. The new ways have come. Okay, the old ways, in fact, he goes on to say in verse 11, here's even these old ways, now these old ways of defining ourselves are gone. These things that would and should have divided us. So he says, he talks about the, the Greek and Jew and circumcised and uncircumcised and, 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 and the, the barbarian and Scythian slave, free, right? These are all ways of category, categorizing us, and Chris talked about this, but that divide us. And he's saying, man, all that stuff is done. Why? Because now Christ is all and in all. Look at verse 11. That's what he says. Because of that, all that stuff should be put away. Because now you're being renewed day by day. Verse 10, he tells us that. You're becoming more and more like your creator. You're becoming, you're becoming all of these things, right? These are the things you should put away. 
because you're now a new person and Christ is all in all. So now we don't boast about those things. We don't find our significance in these things. We don't put our confidence in these things. We don't find our primary meaning in these things. Like I don't go and say, man, you know, it's my ethnicity that gives me my primary meaning. No, Christ is all and in all. It's my academic achievements that give me my primary meaning. No, Christ is all and in all. It's my language. It's my whatever. It's my social status. It's my zip code. It's my politics. These are the things that primarily define me. And Paul says, none of that. Christ is all and in all. And you understand, you understand when a church, when this is the bedrock of a church, if every person at a church said, man, Christ is all, like that church is invincible. That church could never be taken down by division. This would, we would be guarded. We would be impervious to that kind of thing because think, man, there's nothing higher than Christ. That's why I want you to see this. If we miss this, we miss it. We miss it, right? This is Paul saying these things will kill unity, but what will build unity, right? We don't just want to go, okay, I want to know what to avoid. For sure, let's, let's avoid those things. Let's not be this way. Let's, let's not be full of malice or slander or envy or, you know, anger and all these things. No, no, but there's got to be then something we do, and there is something we do, and he's going to give us now things that will build us up. Here's the things that will, will allow us to walk in unity, and what I want you to see is our unity hinges on what we put on and put on. Off. It's our clothing. As I say, like your clothing, your spiritual clothing either causes or causes division or, or creates unity. And he, here he, we, we reject that old man. We put on the new man. And, and, and verses 1 through uh, 11 it says, don't, don't wear this, right? What not to wear. And verses 12 through 17, what you should wear. What you should put on. What should be true of the Christian. Okay, so, so these are unity killers. Now, what are the unity builders? That's where he's going to go. He's going to say, look, the unity builders are putting, first of all, putting on the right clothes. So look at that. Look what he says. Verse 12. And I hope you're following along with me. I hope you have your Bible open and your, your, or your Bible app on. Look, he says, put on then. Now, stop there just for a second because I always think it's helpful to do a little bit of grammar. Uh, uh, if, if, if I were to give you a literal translation of, that put on then says put on therefore. And the reason I bring that to you is because look up in verse 6. He says put to death therefore. And then he says in verse 12, put on therefore. In other words, both 6 through 11 and 12 through 17 are logical implications, we could say this, of verses 1 through 4. Okay, so let me just summarize. If you're a Christian, verses 1 through 4, Put to, put to death these things. If you're a Christian, verses 1 through 4, put on these things, right? Do this. This ought to characterize you. Now, we read what he says, put on as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, and put on compassionate hearts and kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiveness, love. The temptation is to go, okay, all right, you know, I, I guess I just have to try harder, well, yes, yes, there, there is a trying within the Christian life. There is an effort, right? We've said this a million times. It's grace-driven effort. But notice that the initiator of it all is God. Like, look at verse 12 again. Put on then. And before I say anything, Paul says, put on then. And let me define you first as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, these things that I list, right? In other words, here's who you are. You've been chosen by God, right? Think of, think of adopted children. Maybe you're a parent who adopted a child, or maybe you're an adopted child yourself, and think about what that meant. Somebody walked in and chose you. This is God. God goes, I chose you. I chose you even when you were rebellious. I chose you when you didn't want to choose me. I chose you. I wanted you, and I brought you into my family. And then he says, and because of that, that makes you holy. We just sang, you know, that song is so amazing, that hymn, holy, 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 right? Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our souls, you know, there's, there's just this, this magnificent statement of God's holiness. And here's the Bible saying, you're holy. You're holy. You've been set apart. You've been, you're, you're, and, and, and according to verse 10, you're being renewed all the time right? Becoming, you are positionally holy in Christ, 
but you are becoming more and more or should be practically holy in Christ, right? So he's saying you're, you're, you're chosen, you're holy, and you're beloved. Now, what's he saying? In other words, now start acting like the family that you've been brought into, right? Start wearing the clothes that show that you belong to this family. Reflect your family of origin. So he says, you put on, because God's done this for you, you're compassionate. You know why you're compassionate? Because God is compassionate. You know why you're, you're kind? Because God is, is, is overflowing in kindness. Do you know why you're meek and humble and patient? Because that's God. We reflect who God is in our lives. He's going to go on in verse 14 and above, or verse 13, and say, bearing with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive your brothers and sisters in Christ. You got a complaint against somebody in here? You upset at someone in here? Right? I mean, this is, this is, and notice the reason you forgive is because you've been forgiven. Because of what Christ, God has done for you in Christ. This is why you forgive. In other words, listen, simply what Paul is saying is I want you to become who you are. In fact, this is how his arguments are structured in most of his books. Here's who you are, first half of a book. Here's what Jesus has done. Here's what God has done for you in Christ. That's your new identity. Now, just go live that out. Live out what this practically means in day-to-day -day life. Start with the fact that God has changed you and now work out from that. Start with the fact of this is my fundamental identity. Here's the truth and now live that out. See, most of us don't start there, do we? The way we live is based on our feelings, based on our thoughts, based on our circumstances, rather than starting with the truth of who we are. He says, so you're compassionate, you're kind, you're forgiving. I can forgive because Jesus forgave me. Now look at, let's talk about this for a second because Paul, Paul you know, takes a verse to describe, right? I think because he knows forgiveness is very, very difficult. It just is. Like some of you, have been deeply, deeply wounded by people. Maybe somebody that you thought was supposed to care for you and love, love you, betrayed you and hurt you, abused you. How in the world do we forgive? Paul tells us, and he's going to say this in numerous ways, he's going to say, you forgive because Christ forgave you. Right? So, so put this in perspective. Your sin, no matter how big or small you thought it was, Right? The Bible's going to say, if you, if you lie once, you're a liar. If you stole a, a little piece of chewing gum, you're a thief. Right? If you lusted one time in your head, you're an adulterer. Okay? And it says, if you've, if you've violated one point of the law, you've violated all of it. And your sin is enough to condemn you to hell. That's what the Bible says. But God being rich in mercy saved you and forgave you and wiped it clean. That's the gospel. And so he says, because of that, now you have a resource that you can draw upon to find the ability to forgive. What's forgiveness? It's simply just deciding to live with the painful consequences of something that was another person's sin, right? Their sin caused you painful consequences. So is it easy to do that? No. Is it costly? Yes, always. It cost Jesus his life to forgive you. He literally laid down his life to forgive you. And this is what we're called to, right? We're simply recall, called, this is what's happening over and over, to reflect the God that saved us and what he's done for us, right? Compassion, kindness, patience, humility, meekness, all that. And then notice this. Above all, verse 13, 14, put on love. Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Love. Above everything, love. This is the Christian ethic. By the way, if we stay with the, the metaphor of like Paul talking sort of put on, put off this clothing idea, I think what he's, I think what he's picturing here is like love is, now, love is now the overcoat, right? Love is the thing you throw on top of all that other stuff and it binds it. It's like, oh, okay, now I see how that, all that goes together. Now, that, now I see how it, all, how it all works, right? That's the idea that love comes along and it sort of makes the outfit, 
It, it, it's like th- th- this is how all this stuff is kept together. Th- this is the Christian ethic. This is the one thing we're going to be called to over and over again. We must love each other. We must love other people. And there's no way of escaping this, right? Romans chapter 13, the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Galatians chapter 5, the whole law is fulfilled in one word, love your neighbor as yourself. 1 Corinthians 13, right? Paul's going to say, we don't have to, we never want to forget that whereas there's faith, hope, and love, he says, but the greatest of these is love. Jesus comes along and says, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. John writes the gospel, but picks up on that in his epistle in 1 John 4 and says, let us love one another. Anyone who does not love does not know God. Love, love, love. This is what we're called to. I want to talk about this just for a moment because I, I want to make sure Love gets thrown out a lot in our culture. We are a few days into what it seems like the world now recognizes as Pride Month, right? I'm not, not, you're not going to hear me get on some, you know, I'm not going to start shouting. I'm just going to say, listen, let's talk about this for a moment because here's what you hear. We hear things like this, love is love. Every form, every expression of love is love. Christian, that's simply not true. We get our definition of love from Scripture. We don't just take what the culture says and says, you call it love. But this is, I get it, this is difficult. Some of you are in work environments, right? Where, where it's almost, it's almost the, 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 the indication of secular orthodoxy that you buy this line. You know, you've, you've got you've to somehow demonstrate your unity with this. And this is a hard place for you to be in. I get that. So I just want to talk, can, can I just take a little bit of a detour just for a moment? Because I want to talk to you about this. Because I, I really genuinely want to be helpful. I'm not here to harangue anybody. I just want this to be helpful because we have to think about love and what it is and what it isn't. Right? Yes, Christian, hear me. Love Love is our ethic. Love is the way we approach things. But love stands up for truth. And, and, and love, love it, it swims upstream in our culture. And love shares the gospel. And love offers the right cheek. And when people strike it, gives them the left cheek, Christian. That's the love we're called to. But love is not love. Every definition of love is not love. We have to distinguish God's love from the world's love. So let me me just show you something. If you have your Bible and you want to look at this with me, turn over to John chapter 14. I think this is really helpful. Jesus is talking here and he says this, John chapter 14, verse 15. He says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Okay, just hear that? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Go down to verse 21, whoever has my commandments and keep them, he it is who loves me. Verse 23, if anyone loves me, he'll keep my word and my father will love him. Verse 24, whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Here's what I want you to hear, Christian, the biblical definition of love, love and obedience to Christ and to his word and to God always go hand in hand. There is no love outside of obedience to God, outside of obedience to His Word, outside of the truth. So, so in fact, 1 Corinthians 13, remember that whole love chapter? Love does this and does that. Loves, it's just wonderful. People read it at weddings. It's just this glorious thing. And Paul says this, love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth in the truth. See, the culture will say to you, maybe your workplace, I know this is difficult, will say love is whatever you want it to be. God is love. How do we counter that, Christian? God is love. Well, true. But the culture basically says love is God. 
God comes and plays a subservient role to whatever your definition of love is. No, that's not how this works, right? Real love points people to the God who loves. That's where, that's the direction. Anything, any, any so-called love that draws you away from or people away from that God is a counterfeit love that is deceiving you. In fact, listen, this is, this is a scary verse here. If you go to Romans chapter 1, I don't have any of these in your notes, by the way. I just realized I needed to talk to you about this today. Romans chapter 1, some of you know that in Romans chapter 1, Paul, Paul's going to say, you know, the wrath of God is revealed against all ungodliness and talk about how, you know, people, they, they, they refuse to believe the truth. They start believing a lie. Um, and so what does God do? He gives them over to the lust of their heart, to impurities, And then he talks about women who desire women. He talks about men who desire men sexually, right? He's talking about lesbianism, homosexuality. Okay, now, in the context of that is when he ends chapter 1, he says this in, in verse 32, though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. Okay, okay, listen, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. It is wrong, Christian, for us to approve of what the Bible calls sin. That's a sin. It is sin for us to call something good, to celebrate something that God doesn't celebrate. It's a sin for us. Love never comes at the expense of truth. It never approves of something that provokes God's wrath. This is not a license for you to walk away from here and be jerks to people. Please hear where we started. Our ethic is one of biblical love that turns the cheek and understands it's going to be hard and sometimes I have to speak the truth, but I'm going to always speak the truth in love. And this is how we're going to relate in a time like this. That when the world says love is love, no, no, it's not. This is love. God's word shows us and it always it, it's always joined at the hip to obedience to God's word and to call something that is disobedient in God's word, love is to mock biblical love, okay? So Paul says, Paul says, man, we need to love. But listen, I think he's talking about this in the context of unity, especially one another. That's why, that's why John's gonna say, man, don't tell me you love God, but you don't love your brothers and sisters in Christ, There's got to be, we've got to fall under the banner of the fact that we love. In fact, I think love is the only virtue that's going to let us um, uh, stay united in the midst of the kind of diversity that Paul talks about in verse 11 that Chris looked at last week. Do you see that in verse 11? I mean, this is all those, we're not not Greek or Jew or Scythian, barbarian, slave, free, all these things that just, like the only thing that binds that kind of diverse group of people together is love and the kind of love the Bible talks about, okay? All right, so, so, so we have to put on the right clothes, okay? That, that's verses 12 through 14, but then we've got to prioritize the right things, okay? In other words, I think, I think where Paul's going here, no, notice something, if you're reading the English Standard Version, right, saying do this, do this, do this, and then he gets to verse 15 and says, and let the peace of God. In verse 16, and let the word of Christ. And I think the implication of verse 17 is the same thing. And let, let do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, right? In other words, these ought to be when you are walking and, and you're seeing verses 12 through 14 play out, right? What do we pursue? What are the things we go after? What, what, what are we hoping to see take hold and en route in the life of Foothill Church and in churches that want to walk together in unity? Well, he's going to say three things. Number one, the peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and then finally the name of Christ, okay? So look at that. Look at verse 15, the peace of Christ. He says, this is one of the things we ought to pursue and prioritize among us and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful, okay? Now, you're gonna see this again. He's gonna say for each of, verse 15, do this and be thankful. 16, do this, be thankful. 17, basically do this and be thankful. 
Okay, we'll get to that in a moment. But, but, but he says, look, the peace of God, what's he saying? He's essentially saying this, Christian, you were called into a body with the goal being peace with one another. With the goal not being arguing and bickering over secondary and tertiary issues, not arguing over the Bible calls them myths, maybe conspiracy theories, whatever they are. That is not what we're called to. We are called to peace. We are called to live and love each other in the context of peace. And Paul says, because you're one body. This is, by the way, this is a brilliant metaphor that, that, that Paul, I think probably Paul picked this up this metaphor on the road to Damascus, you might remember in Acts chapter 9 when he's knocked off the horse and Jesus speaks to him and says, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul's going, well, I'm not. I'm, I'm persecuting these people. Like when you, and, and essentially Jesus is saying, when you persecute my church, my body, you're persecuting me. I think this is probably where Paul picks up on this and goes, oh, the church is the body of Christ. Now, this is a brilliant metaphor because think about this. When your body is functioning the way that it's supposed to function, it, um, it's peaceful with itself, isn't it? Right? My hand isn't going after my foot. Right? What are you doing? You know, it's not trying to gouge out my eye. Right? It's everything just sort of cooperating with one another. But sometimes things happen in our bodies, right? And it feels like your body is at war with you. That's called sickness. That's called disease, right? That's a problem. And, and, uh, and so, so Paul's going to say here, you know what allows you to live at peace with one another is your one-bodiedness. If you're not sick, if you're healthy, then this is what's going to happen. And the one-bodiedness only comes about from the fact that you were called into this. In other words, God brought you vertical peace, right, through his calling, chosen, right? You were chosen in him, all that. He brought you to himself. He said, man, I'm going to adopt you into my family. Now that there's reconciliation and vertical peace with God, therefore, you can have peace with one another. That's the goal. That's what's happening. And then what happens? He says, and be thankful. You see that in verse 14 or 15? He says, and be thankful. He's going to end each section this way. Isn't this interesting? In other words, here's, here's what I think Paul's doing. If, if you're walking this way together as a church and there's peace and God has brought, not, not, not a peace at any expense. We'll talk about that in a moment, Right? This is not an artificial peace. This is like God has brought you what we would call a supernatural peace. There is a, it's, a, it's a gift. It's, it's, it's the psalmist saying how good and how pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It's like oil running down Aaron's beard. Isn't that a strange metaphor? How does peace and unity and oil have anything to do with anything, right? I think here's this idea. The, the oil in, in the Old Testament is representative of of the anointing of the Spirit, right? So the kings would be anointed or the high priest would be anointed. This is the pouring out of the Spirit upon the high priest. And it's so overflowing. Literally, they would do this. It would flow down their beard. When we dwell in peace, that is like God's just pouring out His Spirit upon us. See, we, sometimes we think of the Spirit being poured out in terms of charismatic gifts and all these things. I have nothing, no problem with that. I'm saying one of the things we ought to see is it ought to be, it ought to be just this incredible peace and unity. And church, when we see that, we should be incredibly thankful. Incredibly thankful. You understand how unusual this is? That we would walk in peace with one another? And that's a gift of God. So Paul says, be thankful, right? So, so prioritize the, the peace of Christ. Prioritize the word of Christ. See that in verse 16? He says, and let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. 
Okay, so, so the idea is, is that we, 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 we've got this peace, we want this peace, but it's not peace and unity at any cost, right? The way we, we unite around the things of Scripture, the doctrines of Scripture, we unite around the gospel, the word of Christ, that's central to who we are. And he says, let it dwell among you. Come and tabernacle. Come and just be present with you so richly, so abundantly that it's just available everywhere. That's the idea. Churches ought to be a place where you can come together and you will, you will see the word of Christ abundantly available anywhere you turn, right? Now, how, how does that happen? How does the word of Christ dwell with us richly? Well, look what he says. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another. Okay, so, so we're teaching and admonishing in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to God, right? With thankfulness in our hearts to God is the idea there. Okay, well, well how do we do this? So how, how does it dwell ritually? Teaching and admonishing and singing. Sounds like church, right? right? Now, but here's the interesting part. It's not just church. Because you notice what he says there, what he tacks on there? It's not, it's not, having a teacher and preacher teach to you. It's not just have people up on the stage sing and help you lead you in song. He says it ought to be happening with one another. One of the one another ministries of the church is that you and I, you with each other, should be teaching and admonishing and singing. Right? And, and, and that's how the word of Christ dwells richly. Interestingly, some of you, if you have any a knowledge of what's called biblical counseling as opposed to psychology. Biblical counseling, you'll hear this term. You'll hear a term called nuthetic counseling. Okay, this is within the biblical counseling room. Nuthetic, N-O-U-T-H-E-T-I-C, nuthetic. Nuthetic is just a Greek word. It's just borrowed from this passage right here, and it's the word admonish. Admonish, it's admonition counseling, right? It's that, it's that one another ministry of people with each other admonishing and helping one another. If the word, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ and the word of Christ is dwelling richly within you, you are, you, you, you are able and you should be willing to admonish, to counsel another believer, because this is how it works, right? This is, this is where we're teaching and admonishing one another. But listen, I think this means there ought to be a posture even among us of I, I know that I need to be admonished, right? None of us see ourselves perfectly, do we? None of us hear ourselves perfectly. And some of the things we have to do is, is put ourselves in circles that invite and even celebrate the fact that there are people around me who are helping admonish me, helping shave off the rough edges. Hey, brother, when you said that, like, there, you, you just sounded harsh. Or, you know what, I've just been noticing you've been very impatient. Or, I, I've noticed, Chris, you're becoming a grumpy old man, right? <laughs> like, I, I've just know that I'm seeing these things in you, right? And I'm going to be specific, and I want to help you, right? I'm not here because I'm just here to criticize you and hurt you. I want to build you up. Like, see, see, this is interesting. Peace of Christ, but the word of Christ admonishing. This is just peace at any cost. Let's just not talk to each other. I saw that, but I won't say anything because I have you know, peace. No. It's the kind of environment that says, it's okay. Like, do you know how desperately I need you? Do you know how much I need you to tell me and help me and help me see blind spots that I don't see? And how much you need me? That's a place where the word of Christ is dwelling richly, right? But then he says, it's not just that. It's not just the teaching and the admonition, right? He says, we sing. We sing, right? And we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Again, we could parse those out. I think here's the idea. We're just singing in every way we know how to, to celebrate God and his goodness. We're, we're, and, and notice that one of the ways the word of God, the word of Christ dwells richly among us is through song. Which means that it needs to be true to the word of Christ. Here's what I know about my sermon today. 
Uh, if I quizzed you next week, most of you would probably be able to, um, would not be able to recite one point I gave you today. I'm not offended by that, okay? I'm just saying that's a reality. It happens all the time, right? You hear a lot of things. You know what, though? I bet you I could get you to sing one of the songs. I bet you you could hum the tune. I bet you there's some phrases and words from the song, right? These things stick with us. That's why it's so important that what we sing is true to the Word of Christ. Let me give you, let me let you in on a little background. How do we choose the songs that you get to hear? Because like, some of you are like worship aficionados. Well, there's that great song and that great group, and how come we don't sing this or sing that? I'll tell you. I'll tell, and I'm saying this is of all the ones we don't sing, but let me, let me tell you the, the triage we run through. Okay, we start with this. Is it biblical? Three questions we ask. Is it biblical? Okay, that's the first question. And the last two are kind of subjective after that, right? The next one is, is it beautiful? And finally, is it singable? Okay, now you're, some of you are like, well, I didn't like that song this morning. It's not beautiful or singable. <laughs> but here's what I tell you. It's biblical. And that's the most important one. The most important one. If we fail that one, it's over. It's never going to come up here. <laughs> we can argue about beautiful. We can argue about singable. We will not argue about biblical. Because the Word of God must dwell among us richly. But notice, it's we're singing. Do you hear this? Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. Do you know that's what you're doing when you stand? And when Tucker or Ike or one of the worship leaders up here asks you, hey, let's sing together. This is not a concert. This isn't to, you know, like wow them or anybody else. This is us singing and admonishing one another in song. Like, brother, keep going. Sister, keep going. Right? We're in this together. We're going to sing. And, and by the way, you know one of the ways you can tell if a song is biblical? Look at, look at how Paul says it here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, singing psalms with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Does the song make you more thankful for God? Or is it about you? Right? Because really, that, that, that's where our song should lead us. I'm not, I'm not saying we should never sing about our spiritual aspirations and things like that. But on the other hand, we ought to be really tilted towards songs that, that extol God, His holiness, His majesty, His beauty, His glory, the gospel, what Jesus has done, the cross, the resurrection. It's all about Him. It's not about us. And making us thankful in our hearts to God, okay? Okay. Peace of Christ, word of Christ, and finally the name of Christ. And I'll be brief here. Look at, look at verse 17. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the Fa to the God the Father through him. Does this have to do with Sunday? For sure. Does it have to do with our gathering? Absolutely. Does it have to do with unity? For sure. But this is also Monday through Saturday. Everything you do in the, in the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything coming under the banner and lordship of Jesus. That it all comes back to Christ. Christ is the center. Christ is preeminent. Christ is the name above every name. It's all about Jesus. That's who we want to see worshipped here. That's who we want to fall under the banner. That's why we can walk in unity. That's what allows us to have peace. Is because everything is not done in the name of Chris or done in the name of some denomination or in the name of anybody else. It's done in the name of Christ. That's what keeps us together. And look what he, listen, I, we, we could summarize, I think, what, what Paul is, is saying like this. All who've accepted Christ are accepted by us. Now, let me, let me define that. I don't mean if you're here this morning and you, you don't believe in Jesus or, you know, you're, you haven't become a Christian, you're not accepted. No, I'm referring back to verse 11. Like, there's no distinction. It's not a male-female thing. It's not a rich or poor thing. It's not an educated and uneducated thing. It's not your zip code. It's not your political party, right? If you've accepted Christ, you're accepted here. But look at this, but all who are not satisfied with Christ will not be satisfied with us. See, I love this. If you're not satisfied with Christ, you know what? Um, if, if you need something more, then you won't be satisfied with us. I hope we can say this, Foothill Church. Ladies, you're going to go to an event, I hope, on Saturday. 
And I'll, I'll just, in case you're thinking, it's not about painted nails and pixie dust. It's, it's not about doing your hair well. It's the Word of Christ. Like you're going to be taught that. Right? And it's going to come under that banner. If you're not satisfied with that, you won't be satisfied with it. Right? We've got to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly. This is why we offer classes. This is why we do Greek. This is why we have home groups. This is why we do, you know, all the things, the Sunday mornings. This is why we preach through books of the Bible. This is why if you go to women's prayer, you're going you're to pray Scripture so that the Word of Christ would dwell richly and so that everything would come under the banner of Jesus Christ. And notice this, Paul ends, same way he has these other sections, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Peace of Christ, thanks. Word of Christ, thanks. Name of Christ, thanks. And this is interesting, Paul commands you to do certain things. He says, this is what God would command you to do. And then says, when you do those things that he commands, be thankful to God for them. Isn't that a weird? That's strange. If I, you know, you say to your, your, your son or daughter, you know, go, go make your bed. And they make your bed. Now come back and thank me. That's kind of what, what's happening, right? That's odd, but that's exactly what's going on. And there's nothing incongruous about it if you're God. Paul's going to say to the Philippians, right? It's God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So when God commands you to do something and you actually find in yourself the will to do it, you say, thank you, God. That would have never been there apart from you. Giving thanks to God through Jesus Christ, the one who saved you. Because everything is a gift from him. It's all his gift to you. Praise be to God. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we do thank you. And um, uh, Lord, this is, uh, it's amazing uh, to realize that you've given us the spirit, you've given us the wherewithal, you've saved us, we will be raised up with Christ if, that's, if, we, if, we, if we are those who have been raised with Christ. And Lord, this can be possible for us. We can walk in this kind of unity. We can put away all wrath and anger and malice and slander and obscene talk from us and forgive each other and love one another. We can walk out of here and love people in the culture who see love in such radically different terms. And we can put on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. We can put on love. Lord, thank you for that. And I pray, oh God, that we would we would walk in unity with one another. Lord, as churches are being fractured all over the place, divisions are coming, that God, we'd be a people that walk because we're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so help us, we pray. God, I pray for anyone here this morning. Say, man, I I've never bowed my knee to, to Jesus Christ. I see wrath, I see malice, I see slander, I see things that I have no power to overcome these things because I don't have the Spirit living with me because I, don't, I haven't put my faith in Jesus. God, may that happen today where there be people who put their faith, their trust in Jesus this morning that submit to Scripture and its authority, not my authority but what you would say over their lives, convict of sin right now and unrighteousness, and then, Lord, bring about the hope of repentance that people would turn to you in faith and turn away from their own sin and be saved. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name.